It's Wednesday, it's 11.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister Theresa Villiers. Labour MP Emma Lewell-Buck, who sits on the Defence Select Committee. Christopher Hope from The Daily Telegraph. And Matthew Taylor, the CEO of the NHS Confederation. Today, the Ukraine crisis. Fears continue for a full-scale Russian invasion. They're simply not interested in finding any kind of resolution to this conflict. Vladimir Putin has stated very clearly that he won't stop at Ukraine. But there's been widespread criticism that the sanctions announced so far by Boris Johnson aren't tough enough. I think the mood of the entire House of Commons yesterday was that the government were not being strong enough. We can expect Ukraine to come up at Prime Minister's questions today. We'll have live coverage at noon. And has banning junk food advertising on the London Underground worked? Let's start with the crisis in Ukraine and have a look at a couple of the front pages. Following yesterday's statement in the House of Commons from the Prime Minister announcing the first tranche or barrage, to use his word, of sanctions against the Putin regime. This in the Daily Express, punish Putin harder now. And this is the front page of the Mirror, which is fury at feeble sanctions. Get dirty Russian money out of UK now obviously reporting similar sentiments there. Uh, my question to start with the panel then is, should the UK government have gone further, Theresa, with sanctions? I'm sure they will go further if uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't withdraw his troops. I think it is right to take a staged approach. This is the first stage. If we were to deploy the entire package now, we'd have nothing left to deploy later when the situation gets more seriously serious. So I think there is scope to go further in the future, but the, today's package is the right one for this situation. Emma, do you accept that? Um, should the UK government have gone further or wait uh, to see how things develop in the way Theresa said? I mean, I don't know when the threshold will be met for the government to introduce more sanctions because, quite frankly, we've already got Russian soldiers in Ukraine. Ukraine are asking us to go further and farther with sanctions. The rest of the world has gone further and farther with sanctions. And we have the West, in particular the UK, has a hell of a lot of leverage here that we aren't using. Who's gone, further, not on, going... who's gone further on sanctions when you say well, the rest of the world? Germany has, in terms of cancelling the gas pipeline. They've suspended it for yes. the moment. Yeah. OK. Um, Chris, do you think Boris Johnson, who was criticised by a lot of yeah. Conservative MPs, you know, former leaders, heads of select committees, saying, no, hit hard now? He was long on rhetoric and tough on action mm. yesterday. That's a problem. He sounded quite Churchillian, uh, often uh, PM sound good talking about the security and how to take on Russia but but the the measures that they announced that the three individuals have been sanctioned already sanctioned by by America the five banks are quite small ones I mean it, given it has so long to prepare for this it did feel quite underwhelming and those headlines in the Express toy sporting the mirror Labour sporting are not surprising at all I think they need to do something quickly the problem is too wide-ranging you're going to hurt Russian people that could turn the Russian people against the West they're trying to isolate Putin as being an eccentric di uh, dictator at the moment, but if you do, if you do, if you hit the Russian people hard, that might, might damage our case anyway. Matthew, you know what I think is odd and rather depressing about all of this is is the terrible inevitability of it. You know, Russia did this in Georgia, <coughs> they did this in the Crimea. Yeah. This this moment was going to happen, and and on the one hand, why is it, given the likelihood of the Putin administration doing this, that we found ourselves so implicated with the Russians in so many ways? And why is it we're not better prepared? But also the critical question is this. Whatever we do, how determined will we be to maintain it? Because we did stuff off of Georgia and then we, after a couple of years, we quietly forgot it all and took Russian money and Russian business. Crimea, the same thing. If I was Putin, I would think, yeah, there'll be a lot of sabre rattling, there'll be a lot of sanctions, and then in 18 months' time, economic interests will surface and we'll go back to where we were before. So there is a credibility challenge for the West here. Do you accept that, Theresa? I think maintaining that international coalition and keeping it together over a protracted period is crucial and is going to be very hard. I mean, I remember back in 2014, Philip Hammond, when he was Foreign Secretary, saying how difficult it was 
even with the, the outrageous conduct of the Russians in Crimea, to maintain an international coalition for sanctions? Matthew? Yeah, I mean, look, we know that Russia has been a rogue actor internationally for many, many years. And it, it, you know, I, I think our response has been based on a kind of strange combination of negligence and self-interest at the expense of a, a concerted international action. And this is, you know, this may be the last opportunity if we don't demonstrate determination now and stick with it when this is no longer front page news, then the message again to Russia will be, well, you can get away with it. Do you think the political will is there for that? It better be. I mean, the risk is that the Baltic states could be next. That's what Liz trusted this morning on the TV. And if, unless there is a, a line in the sand, as Matthew says, that, and, if, and we hold to that, but it's going to start impacting on voters' lives. We're reporting in the Telegraph today about the risk of increasing mortgage rates, um, fuel and gas prices, obviously, um, other, other grocery bills going up. I think it will, it, it's going to change our lives quite a lot at some point soon. All right. Well, um, as uh, Emma was saying, um, other parts of the world have also introduced sanctions, including the EU, or their about to. Let's uh, talk to our Europe editor, Katia Adler. She's in Paris, can give us more detail on the EU's response to the crisis. Hello to you, Katia. We've been discussing the criticism um, that has been levelled uh, across, really, the House of Commons at Boris Johnson's announcement yesterday that perhaps the, the, the level of sanctions didn't quite match the rhetoric used by Boris Johnson in terms of being tough uh, with Russia. Um, the EU is about to announce its package of sanctions. What does it look like? So the EU has already um, announced a package of sanctions. It's been rubber stamped by uh, the foreign ministers here in Paris yesterday. But this is the EU, of course, so there are many, many, many layers of bureaucracy. So each member state has received a legal text that needs to be signed off. So we're expecting to hear confirmation of the package later today. Now, the EU is known for bickering, isn't it, amongst member states. When it comes to foreign policy, this is always really difficult for the EU. 27 different countries, they have to agree unanimously to make any decision uh, on, uh, on foreign policy. And there was a lot of nervousness in EU ranks um, that they would be able to be seen to step up to the plate to swiftly respond, despite all the layers of bureaucracy, when it came to sanctions in Russia, and also to show European unity. I, I would say they did pull it off. They did pull it off here in Paris. Um, member states are allowed to make tiny tweaks to the text, um, but not anything big at all. They know, the EU knows this is a credibility issue. The EU is also very aware that this is a security issue. I think the EU, along with the rest of the Western allies, they believe that Vladimir Putin likes to try and divide in order to rule over his opponents. So you did see, however, the individual packages are judged yesterday. They were announced within a few hours between the US, the UK and the EU. Here here is our first package of sanctions. And again, I think the emphasis was on first package because there is a fear that Russia will take further action in Ukraine. For the EU, it was stronger than expected, um, targeted at every single person who approved the recognition of the two breakaway uh, republics. That's yeah. all 351 members uh, of, uh, of the Russian parliament, the Duma, um, and also businesses, uh, banks, individuals um, who support Russian action in the two breakaway publics and restricting Russia's access to financial and capital markets. Um, and the EU says, you know, this, this is just the start. Right. I mean, of course, we need to see the impact of the various packages of mm. sanctions and whether or not, to some extent, Vladimir Putin has priced them in, as some people are already saying here. I mean, perhaps what was most dramatic yesterday was Ger Germany's announcement that it was suspending uh, the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. Uh, but since then, Russia, of course, has warned um, that Europe will suffer sky-high gas prices for doing so. What's been the reaction to that? So I think absolutely. I mean, that was Germany's decision by itself. So that wasn't part of the EU sanctions package. And I think they took fellow member states by surprise. Olaf Scholz, he's still a new chancellor in Germany. Germany's always sort of trod this very, very sensitive line and between Russia and the EU. They rely much more than the European average, which is relying 40 per cent uh, from Russia for gas supplies. Yeah. Um, and, and so this is a very big deal, the pipeline. Germany knows, the rest of Europe knows, that when you issue sanctions against Russia, you can expect counter-sanctions. Energy prices are already enormously high. There's been a warning from the Federation of German Industry that, that spiralling prices could deal a body blow to the German economy, which, as the biggest in the EU, will have a knock-on effect elsewhere. So nobody underestimates the severity of all of this. The gas pipeline wasn't yet up and running, but could have been any time soon, as long as it was certified. So this is definitely a concern 
in Germany and the rest of Europe. And even though there are reassuring noises from the European Commission and from the US that alternative sources of natural gas will be found, yes. Germany has admitted it will take mm. it four to five years to wean off its reliance on Russian gas. All right, Katia Adler there in Paris, thank you very much. I mean, do you feel, um, Theresa, that there is a sort of reluctance to go too far in terms of hitting Russia because of the harm it could do to the UK? Just listening uh, to, obviously, the consequences, the possible consequences of suspending the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline for Germany. I think the government is very clear that it wants to put in place a very serious set of sanctions. And as I said, this is, this is just the first stage. Unless the situation resolves itself, we will see greater sanctions. And I think we can deliver them without significant harm to our own economy, not least because our success in delivering renewables means that we're less dependent on gas well, and only 3% of our gas comes from Russia. Yeah, and I was thinking less uh, of gas and actually more about financial sector and more about the city in terms of the connections. The Russia report, you sit on the Intelligence and Security uh, Committee, the Russia report, which was delayed in its publication in terms of looking at links uh, between Russia and Russian money particularly and British politics. A lot of it was redacted uh, and it was delayed. Do we really know the full extent of Russian money and financing in in London, the city, the square mile? What we do know is that London is one of the most highly regulated jurisdictions in the world. It's got some of the toughest anti-money laundering rules in the world. We're the first country to publish a register of beneficial ownership. These issues are taken very seriously, but we do need to go further, which is why the government is going to be publishing an economic crime bill to further strengthen our efforts to make sure illicit money isn't in London. Emma? Well, the Russia report should have been implemented a long time ago. It's been out since 2020. And I think there's an issue here, isn't there, that, you know, it's time for some transparency from the Tories about their links to some of the Russian money in this country. There seems to be a reluctance from the Prime Minister to act and go hard on this. There's a lot of strong rhetoric from him and from the Foreign Secretary. Now, the Defence Secretary said, our plan is about deterrence and diplomacy. It is not a deterrent if you're not going hard on these sanctions, if you're not hitting banking, if you're not hitting SWIFT, if you're not getting rid of Russia today off our airwaves and stopping its propaganda. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things the government can do. They're not doing them, and everyone is deeply confused why they're not doing it. Because right. ultimately, this is about people's lives in Ukraine. All right, I mean, talking about things like SWIFT, international bank payments, I mean, these things would hit hard. Uh, Keir Starmer suggested them yesterday. Yes. Do you think the government will really consider those sorts? Well, of those are the areas might hit Russians, like I was saying earlier, you see. That's what Tobias Elwood's warning. He's saying that if, you, if it's not focused on the actual people around Putin, there's around 600 people associated with him. Go after them and go after them hard, but don't go after all of Russia. Right, Labour have suggested uh, that the Russian state uh, bat broadcaster RT be banned. Do you think... That would be a good idea. Yeah, I think it's a propaganda machine. You know, and we may have to make sacrifices, but that's what you have to do when you're in a conflict. And, you know, we are not far short of a kind of Cold War situation here. There's a kind of wonderful irony, isn't it, that it's now the Conservative Party that's being attacked for taking, Ru taking Russian gold. I mean, it was always historically the Labour Party that was subject to that, that kind of allegation. And, and I, I, I just would say, you know, party funding is a mess. And the way in which we fund, we fund our political parties causes problems over and over again. It keeps decaying public trust. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that the Conservatives are corrupt in this, but, you know, when you take money from very rich people who are closely connected to the Russian leader, you are compromised in a situation like this. So I would just say this is another reminder of the fact we ought to clean up the way in which we fund party politics. What's your Theresa? alternative? I, I have to come I mean, all the Conservative Party donations are, are lawful, they're properly registered... There's, there's a lot of nonsense talked about Conservative... No, but it is Russian awful, but it is awful, but... But it is not... Hang on, let Matthew come out and I'll come back to you. It's lawful, but when the general public see people paying large amounts of money to be in the presence of the Prime Minister or Ministers, a pres they would never, no ordinary citizen has got access to, to that, that, kind of, that kind of access. So it, it, it understandably leads people to feel suspicious and it decays trust at a time when actually we need to try and strengthen trust. I so as I say, I'm not accusing anyone of corruption. I'm saying that it doesn't look good and we don't have to fund po politics like this. No, I, I don't think it's, it's helpful to try and turn this into a, a politicised argument. When, when we're, we're talking about a a very serious potential war of aggression in Europe. That is the big issue. The Conservatives 
declare their, their donations in the appropriate way and they were all lawful. And that's been underlined, Emma, by the Foreign Secretary today, Liz Truss. No donations will be returned because they have all been uh, lawfully given to the Conservative Party. Is there a risk of conflating uh, two distinct issues that uh, people who are British citizens who are on the electoral register, yes, they may have a, a Russian background, um, yes, they may be extremely wealthy, um, but they are legitimately giving to the Conservative Party in this case? I think it's about the optics of it, isn't it? I mean, that photo that's doing the rounds of the foreign secretary with a former finance min Russian finance minister, you know, this doesn't look good. And it looks like well, it's adding to the argument that the political will isn't there. Return the money and then that argument will die down. Just return it. But, but what's the alternative? I mean, it's the alternative that we ask taxpayers to pay for parties. I mean, yet, yet they'll get more, more, more cost on them. I think we have a degree of... They have to, parties like yours, Theresa, yours, Emma, must justify themselves to people who pay their own money to support you. That's how it should be. All right, we're going to talk about the NHS because we have uh, Matthew Taylor here as the chief executive of the NHS Confederation. Just before we get into it, tell our viewers exactly what the NHS Confederation is and does. So it's the organisation that represents all parts of the NHS in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Right. New report out. We'll just show everybody this headline in The Times. Bureaucrats threaten plans to improve health and social care. What are you worried about? So it's a slightly sensational headline, but predictable, I guess, <laughs> given what the report was about. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, at the moment, through the NHS and Care Bill, we're creating a new structure for the health service around uh, integrated care systems. Now, this involves devolving power. It involves encouraging bit, different parts of the NHS to work more effectively together and the NHS working more effectively with the local government and other organisations. Right. What um, we're saying in the report is that if that is going to happen, that devolution of power, then the centre, uh, whether it's DA, the Department of Health or NHS England, has to let go a bit because you can't devolve power and then continue to over-regulate what goes on in the health service. We have a very centralised health service here. So, so we're basically saying the centre needs to reimagine the way that it works to, if you like, lose an empire and find a role if this devolved model is going to work. Emma? Um, these integrated care systems really concern me. They're based on the USA model, which would essentially mean that all the regulation would be taken out. We'd move from a regulated market to an unregulated one, and we'd have a scenario very similar to what we've seen through COVID, where ministers are just awarding contracts to anybody without any track record of delivery. That so really concerns me. Just, I, I'm afraid that's just not right. I mean, actually, the big thing that's happening, it, it's a big thing if you look at... The, the last 15 years, actually, this is a bill that reduces competition in the health service and, and expands collaboration. So actually, instead of having to have kind of, uh, a market system for determining who does work in the health service, it'll work much more through collaboration. That's our point. If you want that local collaboration, you need to let local leaders lead. And at the moment, well, there's too much central determination of what they do. Private companies will sit on those boards and decisions will be made about where finance goes for patient care. That concerns me deeply. But why does it concern you? What is it that concerns you specifically? Because, as you will know, and we said on this programme many times, it was under the Labour Party, under uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, that competition was introduced to some extent into the NHS, and there's still a very low level of private sector contracting out pre the pandemic, this is, uh, in terms of the NHS. So what is it you're specifically worried about, about what Matthew is suggesting? I think just to come back on that point, the privatisation in the NHS and the fragmentation of its started with the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. That completely changed the shape of the NHS. The Health and Social Care Bill that's gone through is predicated on the similar premises. It's about privatisation. It's not about patient care. It's not about looking after nurses and doctors. Privatisation, of course, in people's minds always means paying at the point of use, which I don't think is uh, going to happen or is suggested. No, absolutely. I mean, as Matthew says, this, this actually reverses the input of competition. <clears throat> This is, this is a set of changes which the NHS itself asked for. It's about ensuring that the NHS can cooperate more closely with local government on delivering social care. I think it's a, it's a good reform. What about the funding? Uh, because there has been huge controversy. Labour is suggesting something very different in terms of raising the amounts of money, Matthew, to pay for the uh, pandemic recovery, to deal with the backlogs. Um, the national insurance contributions are set <coughs> to go up in April, raising uh, about £12 billion a year. Is that going to be enough to deal with the backlogs? Look, it's not as much as we would want in a perfect world, but we're aware of the pressures on the economy and on public services. It's really important to recognise that 
from 2010 to 2020, when COVID started, we had the lowest growth in health service spending we've had since it was created because of the kind of decade of austerity. We went into COVID with nearly 100,000 vacancies. We went into COVID with an estate that was crumbling. We have then had COVID and the amount of pressure that's built up in, over those two years. So if COVID goes away, and we all hope it will, we can get to work. It's not just, by the way, in hospitals that we've got problems. We've got huge back, uh, backlogs in mental health and community services. Uh, we can make progress on this, but we've got to be realistic. It's, it's going to take time because we didn't start in the right place and we've got two years of built up backlog. But actually, over the next few years, I'm confident that we can make progress. Chris? Well, we certainly, I mean, everyone, everyone hopes so. Everyone applauds for what you're saying, Matthew. There is a, a guy called Tim Briggs who's got a, this guy, idea of get it right first time. And I wonder what you might think about more efficiencies in health service and about is it working as well? A lot of the Tory MPs I speak to are frustrated that it's basically a bottomless pit. And every three years, the government comes back with a, a, a bigger cash demand on top of, of general taxation. Well, I don't think it's a bottomless pit. We, we probably spend slightly less per head than other countries on, uh, on health. Um, but there's real opportunities. Yeah, with digital, with med tech, um, you know, there were very big changes that happened during COVID. We all got used, for example, to diagnosing ourselves at home. Uh, we saw much greater collaboration uh, in the health service. We saw a move to digital, which was so actually I think one of the opportunities now is to take the innovation of the last two years and apply that. And we do need to accelerate that in the health service. There's no question. But we need also to be realistic with the public because, for example, as the Secretary of State himself has recognised, there are probably millions of people who aren't on those waiting lists who ought to be because they haven't come forward during COVID. What do you say also to Chris's point that uh, there are Conservative MPs and maybe Labour MPs too who view the NHS as, yes, needing substantial amounts of cash, but that it is, to some extent, a bottomless pit and that other departments, like education, for example, suffer as a result because they don't get as much of the pie? I don't think the NHS is a bottomless pit. I think it's one of our country's greatest achievements. And I think everybody, no matter where you go, values the NHS. We all understand it needs to be paid for. But the reality is, you know, the, the health secretary has come up with a plan that sees an ambition to reduce waiting lists by 2024 and then to tax the poorest with national insurance hikes. Only this government could come up with a plan so incompetent that you ask people to pay more for care that they're going to wait longer for. So it's how a nonsense. Would, how would you raise the money beyond this windfall tax? which would raise a substantial amount of money in the first year. But this is a three-year plan amounting to about £36 billion. Where would Labour find that sort of money? Well, there is money out there. I mean, why not use some of the Brexit freedoms to tax some of the tax giants? Why not do windfall taxes? Why does, why does the tax burden in this country always fall on working people? Are you in favour of those uh, NI, national insurance contributions, going up? Well, I wish we didn't have to do them, but we, we do need to spend this money on the NHS and we do need to do it in a responsible way so we don't damage the public finances. So that does leave us with this tax increase. We are getting... It's not just the COVID backlog. We're getting older as a society, and that does mean that we have to continue to substantially increase what we invest in taking care of our people. Right. That's and true in every country. Yeah. That, 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 the, the, the big driver is an ageing population, and that's why you'll see health costs rising everywhere. Of course, but you said, actually, just before, uh, Matthew, that you felt we were spending less as a country than some comparable European countries. We, we can't find accurate figures for very recently because of the pandemic, but the share of GDP, a measure of the size of the economy, attributed to health in this country, rose to around 12.8% in 2020, according to the Office for National Statistics, up from 10.2%. Um, how much further do you think it'll go as a share of the GDP? Well, we are going to have to respond to population ageing. But I, I, I genuinely believe that in the medium term, we can see a health service which is actually able to deliver better outcomes without having to increase the proportion of GDP. But that is... That is kind of five or ten years in the future. It relies on us making the best use of technology. It probably means a shift in responsibility so that people take more responsibility for their own health. And the other thing we've got to do, which we've been talking about for years, and that I think the, the new system way of working is going to contribute to, is shifting money upstream into primary and prevention so that we, to, to use a phrase that I used at IPPR many, many years ago, we need more fences at the top of the cliff and fewer ambulances at the bottom. We need to prevent people getting sick yeah. rather than just deal with the fact that they are. All right, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, preventative care. Let's just talk briefly about the culture of the NHS because, Emma, as you said, it's one of the UK's proudest achievements. Does the sort of cultural resonance of the NHS, some people say it is a religion in this country, prevent people talking and perhaps criticising it in some ways and in the way it's run? 
I don't think so at all. I think everyone acknowledges that the NHS needs more money and needs more investment. Everyone values it. You know, at some point in your life, everybody is going to have used the NHS. It's clearly a thankless task for, for politicians like Theresa's party because any problems are hers and any victories are ones for the medics and the hero, heroes of the NHS. It's a difficult one for politicians. I can see why they want to get much more control over, over accountability in NHS because they haven't got much at the moment. Right, but in terms of... Let's, can we just say, let's not be too pessimistic. Mm. You know, we did, when we invested over a long period of time, reduce waiting lists, we hit the targets, we got to a point where long waits were virtually abolished and then over that 10 years of austerity those waiting lists went up again. We, we've done it before and we can do it again as long as we sustain investment and we use the best innovations that are available to us. All right, well, let's end on that optimistic uh, <laughs> note. Um, and, um, oh, actually, before we go on, I've just been reminded, actually, about free testing. Um, talking about COVID and living with COVID, there is still a discussion and a debate um, ongoing about who will still get free COVID tests beyond April the 1st. W what is the latest uh, from you in terms of the government? So the government has announced that staff working in social care will get free tests uh, it hasn't yet clarified whether staff working in the health service will. And I think it would be crazy if we don't ensure that we fund free testing for health service. So it, may, it is the case now, and it's brilliant news due to vaccination and better treatment, that COVID is has no worse acuity than flu. But the fact is you wouldn't allow somebody who had flu to come into a hospital or to see patients. And COVID can be asymptomatic. It can be that you don't know that you've got it. So we really don't want people going into hospitals who have got this disease and they're passing it on because it can still be very serious for people, particularly if they have other vulnerabilities. So, you know, not forever. We all want to get to normality. But, but while we're in the situation, we've still got quite high incidence of this disease. We've still got the dangers of declining immunity a new variant, mm. we ought to provide free tests for NHS staff. Have you had any indication from ministers? No, it seems to be kind of wrapped up in a bit of a debate between the department and, and, and the Treasury. And I think whatever happens, it's really important this is paid for. We don't want a situation where individual hospitals have to decide whether or not they put the money into elective care or providing tests for their staff. Right. Theresa, should the government fund this? I think they should. Um, at, at least at least for the next few months, it is it is crucial to infection control in our hospitals. Right, so you, you'd like to hear uh, Sajid Javid come to the House and say that the Department of Health or the government is going to fund for NHS staff, certainly frontline NHS staff. Emma, I presume you agree? I do, and I think we're in the scenario again, aren't we, where the Prime Minister, to save his own skin, makes an announcement and then the detail is still being thrashed out days later. It's absolutely ludicrous. If he was going to do, if he was going to lift all COVID restrictions, all of this should have been ironed out in advance of Monday's announcement. It seems to me that's a spring statement announcement before this. Yeah. this, this I mean, that's what likely... Which is coming at the end of exactly. March. Exactly. There's a debate now. Rishi Sunak's trying to put that marker down on we've got to stop spending so much money. But I reckon they might move us to his house. All right. Well, we'll wait and see, of course, uh, only a few weeks until that spring statement from Rishi Sunak. Um, let's have a look at this tweet from the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who's been praising the success of a junk food advertising ban on Transport for London services. We introduced junk food ad restrictions on TfL to help address child obesity and close the health inequality gap. It's great to see our action is making a difference. Uh, it's also part of a study from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that found between June 2018 and December 2019, households purchased at least 1,000 fewer calories a week due to the advertising ban. And it comes as the health bill is going through Parliament. Uh, Theresa, would you be in favour of extending uh, that sort of advertising ban on unhealthy foods? I think there is scope for greater restrictions on advertising for unhealthy foods. The government has put forward plans to restrict it online. I'm slightly sceptical about the impact claimed for this TfL ban, but there is no doubt that we have to do something about obesity and supporting people to make healthier choices in terms of what they eat, I think, is important. And some further regulation of advertising can be part of that. What's your scepticism about the claims? Well, they're, they're, the claim is that it would have a considerably greater impact than the analysis done on the, the government proposals. Um, and so I think the analysis has been challenged by a number of other academics. 
But um, it, it remains the case that we have to take obesity seriously if we're going to become a healthier population. I mean, the Prime Minister clearly thinks advertising is an issue. Um, Emma, he announced in June last year that junk food advertising will be banned online and before 9pm on TV from 2023. Um, he did talk about tackling the obesity crisis by himself saying he was too fat when he uh, contracted COVID-19. Um, and he promised that the anti-obesity strategy would not be bossy or nannying. Do you support that? I mean, it's a watered-down version of our policy that the Labour Party had. And, you know, they've made lots of concessions to advertising industries. And what we've seen here is a Labour mayor taking the tough decisions that the government won't because they want to protect their friends in business. Theresa? We are taking this seriously. You do have to get a balance, though, between action which is effective, which isn't unduly intrusive into people's lives. In terms of junk food advertising, I've, I'm particularly concerned about the targeting of children and young people. Um, but I do think with any advertising bans, we need to look at them carefully, make sure they're targeted and guard against unintended consequences. I mean, we need to be careful here because there's a strong link between obesity and poverty as well. Now, the sugar tax levy was supposed to go in to help and feed children, helping them make healthier. £3 million pounds of that's gone missing. The mm. government cannot say where that has gone. Yeah, and we'll come to that in a moment, because it is true, George Osborne always said that the money would be ring-fenced to be spent on children's health, and it hasn't been so far. Obviously, we haven't got a government minister here. It's something we will talk about after Prime Minister's questions. What's your view about the effectiveness and the efficacy of banning junk food advertising? So I think it's important that the starting point for this is it's not about restricting people's freedoms, but it's about countering the fact that billions of pounds are spent by industry to promote us eating things that aren't good for us. And that quite often we don't realise that when we eat things, you know, if you have a tablespoonful of tomato ketchup, you get a teaspoon of sugar in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are measures that we have to do to counteract that. The, the tax on sweet fizzy drinks mm. is having an effect. This has an effect. So it's really about, about balancing things so that the public is protected from an industry which quite understandably is trying to promote its products, whether or not those products are good for us. It's a labelling issue, I think. A Brexit freedom, which Theresa knows about, is putting teaspoonfuls of sugar that you describe onto bottles rather than have this how much grams per sh of sugar per 100 grams, which is meaningless to a lot of people. So having better quality labelling is one of the, one of the ways of, of informing people. But well, it, it's also about encouraging companies to reformulate their products so that they're they're well, more healthy and they can advertise those yeah. products. Which is what happens with the with the, the tax on, on sweet fizzy drinks. Absolutely, they, because manufacturers have reduced the amount of sugar in their tax drinks. That is, isn't ring fence, and that's the point. And that's why the long term issue about the the national insurance increases will that stay money stay ring fenced on social care and, and NHS or will it go wider? Right, but how far should government intervene if obesity is such a big issue, particularly for young people? In the way the prime minister said. How far should government go in intervening in people's lives? Well, they, as I said, they, they have to take a proportionate approach. They have to make sure that whatever measures they're adopting don't end up with unintended consequences. It's an incredibly difficult balance to get, but we do need to take action on obesity. So how far would you go, then, in terms of tackling, you say, the businesses that are making so much money in terms of banning advertising and also, what, increasing taxes, spreading them more broadly, not just a sugar tax? I mean, it's about strong public health messaging and introducing something perhaps similar to the sugar tax. But again, I want to go back to the point that if you're going to introduce taxes, don't, don't be honest about where the money's going. Nobody knows where the money's gone from this sugar tax. You know, there's three million children going to school hungry every morning. That money was supposed to be for them and the government won't give it to them and won't say where it's gone. Right. Should the Chancellor come forward and say, why is it going into the black hole of the Treasury and not being ring-fenced or earmarked specifically for improving children's health? Well, actually, I, th I think products are being reformulated. So, actually, there isn't a huge amount of revenue being raised because a lot of the products now fall outside it. So, in a sense, it's been successful, but it's not generating a huge amount of income. I have to say, I'm not generally speaking in favour of tax hypothecation because I think it's a bit of a, a trick, really. In the end, government has to take responsibility for where it spends money. It ought to be investing more in children's health. 
whether that's healthy school meals, whether that's sport at school, whether that's support for people who are obese, whether it's these kinds of public health measures. We need a national strategy on obesity. And like any complex policy problem, it involves lots of different interventions. So the important thing is to, is to invest where we need to invest. And, uh, you know, if hypothecation makes a tax more acceptable, well, that's fine. But, but as, as Chris will confirm, in a way, it's a bit of a kind of slice of hand, really. Right. I mean, it's been reported that Boris Johnson's considering dropping a ban on buy one, get one free deals on junk food to win back support from Conservative MPs. Would this be a bad idea? This is an interesting example. Of <laughs> the new Conservative idea. I didn't realise this was part of Conservative ideology, the, well, the, the, the liberty of, of, of well, buy one, get one free. Operation Redwood to save the Prime Minister that he's moving away from some of the pledges that he's made. Operation Chocolate Orange under David Cameron <laughs> when he was going to ban this, the sale of them for a pound at, the, at, the, at uh, Tills. I mean, I think, you know, at what point does the Tory party have to say it's a freedom issue, hear the facts, here's some teaspoons of sugar on the labelling, make your choice. All right, let's just, uh, let's just show you uh, this uh, headline in the Shields Gazette. Man attacked Office of South Shields MP Emma Lewell Buck with garden ornament after asking for a safe house. What happened, Emma? Um, the gentleman came into my office for help. And my members of staff tried to help him for over 45 minutes. He became agitated. He swore at them. He spat at them. And then he had some kind of garden implement or ornament with him and started to try and smash the glass of my office. Right. I mean, how are your staff? How, how do you feel about it in terms of safety generally for MPs? I mean, I think, like most MPs, you know, we're... We're all worried about our safety, particularly female MPs. Mm. But I worry more about my staff because they're my face when I'm here all week. So for four days of the week, if anything happens in Parliament that they're angry about, that someone's angry about, my staff get it, not me. And I'm really concerned about that because they didn't put themselves forward to be a public figure. They didn't put themselves out there to serve. They just want to work in my office and help the people of South Shields the best they can. Theresa, how concerned are you generally about not just your own safety but the safety of your staff? Well, I, I too really worry about my staff because they're, they're sort of literally in, in the front line and it's just such a few months since Sir David Amos mm. was, was appallingly murdered that I think these concerns are, are very high in all our consciousness, not least because I think most of us get aggressive and threatening emails on on a very regular basis. Thankfully, these kind of physical attacks of people turning up in your office and, and being abusive are, are not quite so common, but the emails are very routine. Every morning we get that kind of stuff. I mean, what more can be done? I mean, I think it's about... A lot of this is about those in public office being very careful about the language they use mm. and the things they say. You know, we saw recently what the Prime Minister said about the leader of my party, Keir Starmer, and the fallout from that. I think everyone has a duty, especially those in public office, especially those in high office, to be very careful about the language they use. And when they do tread into that territory, apologise very swiftly when they realise the damage that they've done. All right, we're just going to pause for a moment... Let's welcome viewers from the News Channel. We are almost 10 minutes or so away from Prime Minister's questions. Uh, the BBC's political editor, Laura Koonsberg, uh, can talk to us now. Hello to you, uh, Laura. Hi, um, let's just go back to Ukraine. We discussed it at the beginning of the programme. Of course, it's going to be central uh, to Prime Minister's mm -hmm. questions as well. Um, there was a point made uh, by Chris Hope here that perhaps Boris Johnson's tough rhetoric when it comes to Russia hasn't been matched by the sanctions, despite the government saying it is the first tranche, the first barrage. Um, is there an expectation management issue here? I think, Joe, certainly there were mood in the House of Commons chamber yesterday after Boris Johnson's statement from Conservative MPs as well as Labour, Lib Dem and other parliamentarians was very much pointing that question at him saying, you know, for a couple of weeks, the UK government has been talking in very strong terms with very stiff rhetoric. Remember that quote, the Prime Minister warned if there was anything, the first toe cap across the border into Ukraine, there mm. would be a terrible sort of the suggestion of hell and damnation pouring upon the Kremlin. Match that yesterday with what we actually saw in concrete terms on sanctions, sanctions on three wealthy individuals with links to the Kremlin and sanctions against five banks. And there very much was the mood in the Commons that perhaps that rhetoric was mismatched with what actually ended up happening. And what we have seen since then is the government really emphasising that this was the first step not the end of the road. There certainly will be more um, stringent behaviour to come to try to squeeze Russia. 
But that certainly has left the government with, I think, yeah, a bit of an expectation management problem. And I think at Prime Minister's questions, we may well hear from Boris Johnson promises of more military support from Ukraine. And potentially, I think he will confirm that there will be more sanctions to come. But it raises the question in this big debate as whether or not sanctions are meant to be preventative or whether they're meant to be punitive. And that is something I think that the UK government is not the only one that's having to confront. No, well, absolutely. And we spoke to Katia Adler in Paris mm -hmm. about the EU's response. They're broadly in line with this sort of staged approach. Um, the questions raised yesterday in the debate uh, by some was, you know, what would the trigger be for further sanctions and more serious? sanctions and Keir Starmer yesterday went quite a bit further in suggesting um, some of the actions that the government could take right now um, but whether that is a balance between um, harming UK interests as well as Russian. I think the reality of making these decisions is that it is fiendishly difficult you know if you take steps to clamp down on one thing of course there could be all sorts of other unintended consequences that is why it is not straightforward. But from a political point of view, I think we will see Labour pushing for tougher sanctions happening more rapidly. But in a broad sense, I don't actually think we're going to see a giant slanging match at Prime Minister's questions today. I think it is one of those moments in UK politics where, yes, there are doubts. There are people, including on the Tory backbenches, who think that the government is being too timid. But overall there is quite a mood of consensus and the vast majority of MPs agree that the government is taking the right kind of approach in terms of bringing these sanctions in in terms of taking a tough rhetorical approach and is supportive of most of the measures that the government is taking so the differences are really of pace and scale rather than whether or not the government's overall approach is the right one but you know I think also what's a big difficulty for the UK government and of course for other Western governments and for NATO is whether or not Vladimir Putin who is someone who would respond in anything like a predictable or normal way to any of these activities you know one senior diplomat was saying to me yesterday you have to think of Vladimir Putin as trying to deal with the government of something like North Korea mm. not the government of Soviet the Soviet Union in years gone by in other words, this is not somebody who is seen as in charge of a sort of stable regime whose next moves can be easily predicted. He's somebody extremely, extremely volatile. And that's borne out by something that the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, this morning was caught saying when he was chatting to some uh, members of the armed forces this morning, he said Vladimir Putin has gone full tonto. Right. Now, I'm not quite sure he wanted that informal remark no. to be out there in the public domain. But it is a moment of candor about just how hard this situation is to predict and fundamentally in the end how much Vladimir Putin cares about any of the kinds of actions that any Western government is taking. Downing Street would say, however, the measures they did took yesterday will affect some of his close comrades. They will really start to hurt the Russian economy. But there are questions about just how prepared the government was to go despite several weeks of rhetoric. Right. I mean, I think we can dip inside uh, the Commons Chamber because MPs will be gathering. We're going to go in for PMQs in just a few minutes' time. We can see uh, it's filling up. But uh, yes, uh, you're quite right, uh, Laura. There will want to be a sense of collaboration and consensus between uh, the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister broadly when it comes to the approach uh, with Russia. And the Prime Minister has used and described um, Vladimir Putin as ill logical at least and irrational if not the term that Ben Wallace uh, was caught saying. Um, just stay with us because I want to talk to you about something else in just a moment. But Brawley, what do you want to hear the Prime Minister say today? Uh, I, th I think we want to hear that the, the UK's con de continued determination to support Ukraine, um, to ensure that our, our programmes which are supporting the training of their, of their troops, um, defensive weapons and of course our own troops stationed in fellow NATO members to help a possible humanitarian catastrophe. Emma from Keir Starmer. I want to obviously we support the government with the sanctions. We'd like them to go further and just want to echo really Theresa's point. 
I don't think there's anything more to add, to be honest. Laura, we're, we're all united on this. We all want to help Ukraine as much as we possibly can. I think today's PMQs will be quite a sombre one as opposed to combative because of that. Right, I'm sure that is the case. Um, Laura, the other issue, of course, we are still waiting for the outcome and the findings of the Metropolitan uh, Police uh, investigation into events at Downing Street and Whitehall. Um, what is the latest on that? Well, the latest is that we don't know when it will come. Downing Street doesn't know when it will come. What I can tell you is that we expect 88 people to be contacted by the Met and asked to fill in those questionnaires, which are the equivalent of being interviewed under caution. I know that some people who believe that they are on the list, people who spoke to Sue Gray about what happened, they have not all yet received their questionnaires. So on the one hand, the Prime Minister speaking at the weekend seemed to give this impression that it could all happen quite quickly. You know, this is not a sort of Watergate-style investigation. It's not an enormous criminal inquiry. This is something where a lot of evidence has already been gathered and has been handed over to the Met. And yet, I think at this point, nobody really, apart from the investigating team at the Met, would be able with any confidence to put a date in the diary for when we're actually going to see these findings. Just one other thing, Joe, I think that may well come up at Prime Minister's questions, despite that consensual approach, whether this is put by Keir Starmer or another backbench MP, are the connections between the Conservatives and some wealthy people with Russian mm. links, but more broadly also the question of Russian money swilling around the City of London, which is something that successive governments mm. have been attacked by critics as never really getting to grips with. Uh, Laura, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to see you after Prime Minister's questions. Chris, on the police report, um, there has been a leak of the form, um, the questionnaire that was actually sent yeah. out to the 88 uh, people, including the Prime Minister. It, it looks as if it's the equivalent of being interviewed under caution. How serious is that in terms of... Well, historically, that was lying in the sand, and the Tony Blair famously said he would quit where he questioned, and he wasn't but under caution. I think... Um, I think Boris Johnson would be thinking, if, if, this, if they came back now, the Met Police, it would be very hard for colleagues like Theresa Villiers to unseat um, uh, Boris Johnson because, of course, there's a, there's a huge conflagration maybe happening in Ukraine. The longer it draws out there and if, if Ukraine settles down a bit, Boris Johnson becomes more risky. He'll be hoping probably for an urgent resolution quickly. In terms of receiving a fixed penalty notice, if that were to happen in principle, should he resign, Boris Johnson? Look, he... This episode has been damaging. He has apologised. He's already implementing Sue Gray's initial recommendations. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. But it's about not hypothetical in principle. Notices. There is a principle here, isn't there, Theresa, that if you are found as a, a minister to have broken uh, your own government's laws, should you go? Look, I, I don't think the issue of a fixed penalty notice should be grounds for deposing a prime minister. But I, I think the important thing is that that the Prime Minister continues to implement the Grey Report and that we move on from this. I think it's important that the Met Police con um, investigation concludes as quickly as possible so we can move on. Right, so there isn't anything that could come out of the Metropolitan Police Report that would make you think that Boris Johnson should consider his position? Well, of course, we'll all await the conclusion of that inquiry, but I would emphasise right. that the Prime Minister has apologised for the mistakes that he's made. It's time for Prime Minister's questions. Threatening behaviour from Russia and in line with our previous support, the UK will shortly be providing a further package of military support to Ukraine. Yeah. This will include lethal aid in the form of defensive weapons and non-lethal aid. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in congratulating Team GB's curling teams for winning gold and silver medals at the Winter Olympics. And Mr Speaker, I know that members across the House will want to offer condolences to the family and friends of our former colleague, Sir Richard Shepherd, who sadly died earlier this week. He served as the MP for Aldridge Brown Hills for 36 years. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. David Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. By 2027, Didcot in my constituency will be 42% larger than it was a decade earlier. Wantage and Grove will be 59% larger. There are thousands more houses going in Wallingford, Farringdon and all the villages I represent. And not a single new GP yeah. surgery. Yeah. 
Does my right honourable friend agree that where we build new houses, we have to build new infrastructure yeah. so that people can still access the services they need to? Yeah. Prime Minister. Yes, of course my honourable friend is right, Mr Speaker, and that's why we're making record investments in the NHS and in schools and roads as we can, Mr Speaker, thanks to the strong growth in our economy, and I'll make sure that he gets a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss his immediate Yet local concerns. But now comes the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join with the comments of the Prime Minister in relation to Sir Richard Shepherd? Mr. Speaker, we all want to deter aggression in Europe. We're not dealing with breakaway republics. Putin is not a peacekeeper. A sovereign nation has been invaded. Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister promised that, in the event of an invasion, he would unleash a full package of sanctions. Yeah. If not now, then when? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, as I said, uh, the UK has been out in uh, front uh, in give, offering military support to, to Ukraine, and I'm grateful for what he said yesterday about the need uh, to make sure that we uh, keep ammunition in reserve for what could be a, a protracted struggle over this issue. But let me, there has been in no doubt about the extent of the package that has already been uh, set out yesterday and, and what we are already doing. Because, Mr Speaker, I don't think people quite realise uh, that the UK is out in front. We've sanctioned 275 individuals already. Uh, yesterday we announced measures uh, that place banks uh, worth £37 billion, pounds, worth £37 billion pounds under sanctions in addition uh, to more oligarchs. And, Mr Speaker, there is more to come. And we will be we will be stopping Russia. We will be stopping Russia from raising sovereign debt, stopping companies, Russian companies, from raising money, and stopping Russian uh, uh, Russian companies. As I said yesterday, even clearing uh, in sterling and dollars on on international markets, uh, Mr. Speaker, that will hit Putin where it hurts. But it is absolutely vital that after this first. Barrage, uh, we work in lockstep with friends and allies around the world. And we squeeze him simultaneously. We squeeze him simultaneously in London, in Paris, in New York at the same time. Unity, Mr. Speaker, is absolutely vital. Yeah. Uh, I hear what the Prime Minister says about sequencing and about further sanctions. But there's already been an invasion. Yeah. And there's clearly concern across the House that his strategy, I accept unintentionally, could send the wrong message. So, so if the Prime Minister, if the Prime Minister, no, if the Prime Minister now brings forward his full package of sanctions, including excluding Russia from financial mechanisms like SWIFT and a ban on trading in Russian sovereign debt, he will have the full support of the House. Will he do so? Uh, I, I'm grateful, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think, I think yesterday, and I'm grateful, by the way, uh, for the general support uh, that the opposition have given, uh, not just to our economic sanctions, but also uh, to the package of, of military support, which will, as I have said, intensify. What we want to see, Mr. Speaker, is de-escalation. Uh, by Vladimir Putin. There's still, there's still hope that he will, uh, that he will see sense, uh, but we, will, we are ready uh, very rapidly uh, to escalate our sanctions as I have, as I have, as I have set out. And under the measures that uh, this House has already approved, and uh, that we can now target, Mr. Speaker, any Russian uh, entity, any Russian individual, uh, we can already target not just the breakaway republics, uh, the so-called the so-called breakaway republics in the oblast of. Uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, we can target members of the Duma who voted to recognise them. This is the most far-reaching piece of legislation of its kind, and I'm glad that it has his support. It does have my support, and if it's used, we will support it. Um, we must also do more to defeat Putin's campaign of lies and disinformation. Russia today is his personal propaganda tool. Yeah, yeah. I can see no reason why it should be allowed to continue to broadcast in this country. So will the Prime Minister now ask Ofcom 
to review its licence. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I believe that my right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, has already uh, asked Ofcom to review uh, that matter. But, but what I will say, Mr Speaker, is that, is that we live in a, in a democracy, Mr Speaker, and we live in a, a country that believes in, in free speech. And uh, I think it's important that we should leave it up to Ofcom rather than to politicians to decide which media organisations uh, to ban. That's what Russia does. Here's Starmer. The request was for a review, and I'm very glad to hear that that review is now happening. And, I, and I'm not, I'm, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to be deflected from the unity that this House needs just at the moment. At the week, at the week. At the weekend, the Prime Minister said that if Russia invades Ukraine, he will open up the matryoshka dolls of Russian-owned companies and Russian-owned entities to find the ultimate beneficiaries within. Well, Russia has invaded, and it's time to act. If the Prime Minister brings forward the required legislation to do this, he will have Labour's support. So will he commit to do so in the coming days? Yes. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we are, we are as, I, as I said, uh, bringing forward in the next wave of sanctions measures that will stop all Russian banks, all oligarchs, all uh, Russian individuals raising money on, uh, on London uh, markets. And uh, we are also accelerating, uh, Mr Speaker, the Economic Crime Bill, which will enable us in the UK to peel back the in the next session, Mr Speaker, to peel back the facade, to peel back the facade of beneficial ownership of, of property in, uh, in, in the UK and of companies. It's gone on for far too long. Uh, we are going to tackle it under this government, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but on all these measures, I think it is very, very important uh, that the House remembers they are more effective when all financial centres move forward together. And that is, that is what the UK has been organising. Mr Speaker, I think I heard the Prime Minister say that the Economic Crime Bill will be in the next session. I, I hope I misheard that. But I can assure him, if he brings it forward in this session, in coming days, it will have our support. There's no reason to delay this. Let me also turn to the Elections Bill. As it stands, the Bill would allow unfettered donations from overseas to be made to UK political parties from shell companies and individuals with no connections to the UK. Labour has proposed amendments that protect our democracy from the flood of foreign money drowning our politics. We can all now see how serious this is. So will the Prime Minister now change course and support these measures in the House of Lords? Mr Speaker, we have very tough laws, tough rules in this country uh, to stop foreign donations. Uh, we, don't accept, uh, we don't accept foreign uh, donations. You have to be on the on the register of uh, the UK Electoral Register to give uh, to a UK political party. And uh, before he starts chucking it around, Mr Speaker, I just remind him his, the largest single corporate donation uh, to the Labour Party came from a member of the Chinese Communist Party. No, 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 Mr Speaker. At, at this moment, as the House agreed yesterday, we have to stand united. And I'm not going to be deflected from that. I note the Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister did not agree to change the Elections Bill. I think that's a mistake, and I ask him to take it away and look at it again, those amendments in the Lords. Putin has invaded a sovereign European nation. He is attacked because he fears openness and democracy and because he knows that, given a choice, people will not choose to live under erratic, violent rule. He seeks division. We must stay united. He hopes for inaction, so we must take a stand. He believes that we're too corrupted to do the right thing, so we must prove him wrong. And I believe that we can. So will the Prime Minister work across the House to ensure that this is the end of the era of oligarch impunity by saying that this House and this country will no longer be homes for their loot? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, I don't think any government could conceivably be doing more to root out corrupt Russian money. And that is, and that is, what, uh, that is what we are going to do. And I think we can be proud of what we've already done and of the measures that we have set up. And I'm, and Mr Speaker, I'm genuinely grateful uh, for the tone of his last question and for the support, and for the support uh, he has given. And he is right that it is absolutely vital that we in the UK should stand united. And people around the world can see that the UK was the first to call out what President Putin was doing uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we've been instrumental in bringing the world together, the Western world together, in lockstep to deal with the, uh, the problem, uh, to bring together the economic package of sanctions that I, uh, that I have set out. And Mr Speaker, there is still time for President Putin, as I've said, to de-escalate. But what is at stake, be in absolutely no doubt, is not just the democracy of Ukraine, but the principle of democracy around the world. And that is why the unity of this House is so important today. And it is absolutely vital that the United Kingdom stands uh, together against aggression in Ukraine. And I am grateful for the, the broad support that we've had today from the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following last week's Q&A at the Shepley Village Association and after receiving a huge number of complaints from constituents, it is clear that speeding is a major problem, not just in Shepley, but across all parts of Dewsbury, Murfield, Kirkburn and Denbydale. Rather than action being taken after people have been killed or seriously injured in collisions, would my right hon. Friend agree with me that prevention is better than the cure and that the Department for Transport Circular 2007 needs a long overdue review. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. Look, I, I, sh I thank him. I share his passion on this issue as a, as a cyclist and I do think that uh, we need to crack down on uh, speeding, which does play a, a, a role in uh, excessive uh, in deaths on our, on our roads, and uh, the Department of Transport is updating uh, the circular that he, uh, that he mentions uh, on the use of speed and red light cameras, and uh, I'd urge him to get in touch with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, this side of the House made clear that the SNP stands united against the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and this needs to be included with tougher and stronger sanctions. But as the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee rightly said, we shouldn't be waiting for Russia to attack others to clean up the corruption and Russian money which has been fueling in the UK. Under the Tories, a sewer of dirty Russian money has been allowed to run through London for years. I went to the Prime Minister, the then Foreign Secretary, in 2017, and I raised the issue of limited partnerships, 113 of which have been used to move $20.8 billion out of Russian banks. Corruption on an industrial scale. Why did the Prime Minister do nothing back then? And why is he still doing nothing now? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm grateful to him. He's, you know, he's, uh, I, I think that uh, he, he was right to come to me then, and uh, I've always enjoyed uh, talking to him, as, I, as I've told him many times. I think he's right uh, on, on the issue. We do need to stop corrupt uh, Russian money in London and every other financial capital. That's why we've already taken uh, the steps that we, we have taken, but we are going much further to uncloak the, the true owners of Russian companies and uh, Russian properties uh, in this country. And, uh, and high time, uh, Mr Speaker, no country is doing more than the UK to tackle this issue. In Blackford. Mr Speaker, that meeting was five years ago and I offered to work with the Prime Minister five years ago and nothing has happened. The truth is that Russian oligarchs who give the right people in power a golden handshake have been welcomed into London for years. Their activities weren't stopped. They were encouraged. And plenty of these golden handshakes just so happened to find their way into the coffers of the Conservative Party. <laughs> Mr Speaker, £2.3 million, pounds, in fact, yep. since the Prime Minister took office. A leading American think tank has publicly raised concerns, and I quote, about the close ties between Russian money and the United Kingdom's ruling Conservative Party are a block to stronger sanctions. Yep. How can our allies trust this Prime Minister 
to clean up dirty Russian money in the UK when he won't even clean up his own political party? Will he finally commit, finally commit to giving up the 2.3 million his party has raised in from Russian oligarchs? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I just think it's very important for the House to understand uh, we do not raise money from uh, Russian oligarchs. Uh, people who get, people who get Money to this, to this, to this. They, they are. They, we raise money uh, from people who are registered to vote on the UK Register of Interest, and that is that is how that is how we do it, Mr. Speaker. And I think I think his indignation, uh, his indignation is, I'm afraid, uh, a, a bit much coming from uh, coming from somebody uh, whose very own Alex Salmond uh, is a leading. Presenter, a leading presenter on, as far as I know, on Russia Today, which the, which the leader of the opposition has just called on this country to ban. So, Bill Wiggy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The River Y, pollution, flooding, house building, and the wider environment are all important to my right honourable friend. So, will he meet me to discuss the future of the Environment Agency? Oh, oh Prime Minister. Well, I'm always happy to to meet my uh, my my honourable friend, uh, and I congratulate him on his on his recent uh, elevation. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I also I also must say that I think the Environment Agency uh, faces many challenges and, do, and does an outstanding job of building flood defences. Uh, 314,000 homes are better protected than since 2015, and we continue to invest massively uh, to help them. But I'm always always happy to meet him. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, when I asked the Prime Minister about Russian meddling in UK elections, he looked very shifty before claiming he wasn't aware of any. Yet, when he was, when he was Foreign Secretary... When he was Foreign Secretary in 2017, in a joint press conference with the Russian Foreign Minister, when Lavrov claimed there was no evidence that Russia had interfered in UK elections in any way, the now Prime Minister corrected him by saying there was no evidence of successful interference. So can the Prime Minister tell us what evidence he has seen of unsuccessful interference? Has he actually read the Russia report, which is very clear that there is credible evidence of interference? And given that And given that, as his Defence Secretary said earlier this week, information is as powerful as any tank, can he explain why he's turning a blind eye to allegations of Russian disruption oh, order. and playing oh, oh, order. 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 I hope we're coming to the end of the question. I do need to go. Mr. Speaker, I could be a lot faster if I wasn't being barracked by the side opposite. I think the challenge is that I do want to get the front benches moving quickly. We want to get speed into it, so I'm sure it's the end now. Given that, as his Defence Secretary said earlier this week, that information is as powerful as any tank, can he explain why he is turning a blind eye to allegations of Russian disruption? Why is he playing fast and loose with our national security? Prime Minister. I, I repeat what I told her ages ago, if I think I've got it right. I've seen absolutely no evidence of successful Russian uh, in, interference in any of our uh, any of any election or any electoral event, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Bacon. Thank, you Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I welcome the uh, steps the government is taking to help hard-working families in Orpington this year with their energy bills, and the majority of people will receive at least £350 of support. But can my right honourable friend confirm that even those not eligible for the council tax rebate will still receive additional support thanks to discretionary funding set aside for local authorities. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and uh, I can tell him that uh, the people of Orpington and elsewhere uh, will receive support if, if, uh, if they don't qualify for the council tax uh, rebate from the £144 million pound fund uh, that he rightly mentions. Kerry McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. How does the Prime Minister think it looks when we're in a cost of living crisis with our constituents struggling to put food on the table or coats um, on their kids' backs? 
when the members of his cabinet are throwing their toys out of the pram because they want to eat foie gras and wear fur. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are tackling uh, the cost of living crisis, which is caused by a global uh, inflation spike, uh, with everything we can do. Uh, and, I, and I thank my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, in particular, uh, for what he's doing to abate the cost of energy, lifting the living wage uh, by the biggest ever amount, Cut, uh, helping people on universal credit, Mr. Speaker. And the, and the single best thing that we've done on, on the cost of living, Mr. Speaker, is making sure that we've got millions more people into work, 430,000 more in employment now than there were before the pandemic began. That's how we're tackling the cost of living, Mr Speaker, and we'll get on with it. Second Batty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last month I held a careers fair at the Woodlands campus of Solihull College. It trains apprentices for the automotive, construction and aviation industry. These apprentices are talented and hardworking, and this is why Flybe has chosen Birmingham Airport in my constituency as their national headquarters. Will the Prime Minister take up my invitation to visit Solihull College and meet these wonderful apprentices and then also visit Birmingham Airport to see how the aviation industry is recovering from the pandemic? Yeah. Uh. Mr Speaker, I'm only too happy, thrilled to uh, visit uh, uh, my, my honourable friend in Meriden at, at any time. Ron Hussein. Uh, Mr Speaker, the member for Sherwood is currently under investigation for Islamophobia following accusations he told a fellow MP that her being a Muslim was making colleagues uncomfortable. How did the government punish this behaviour? with a promotion that puts the accused member in charge of the complaints procedure. And of course, Mr Speaker, we all know that the Prime Minister himself is no stranger to derogatory remarks about Muslim women. So let me, order, let order, me order, ask order, the Prime order. Minister... Order. This is not the appropriate place to be raising this. We now go to Nicky Aitken. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have just come from a meeting with the London Pedicabs Operators Association, Transport for London, Department of Transport, where, sadly, the Honourable Member for Christchurch confirmed that on Friday he will be objecting once again to my Pedicabs London Bill, which means it will fall. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that it is time that we legislated for pedicabs yeah, to make yeah. sure that they are safe for women and girls to yeah, use, yeah, that yeah, we yeah, rid yeah. ourselves of the, the dodgy fares and that, that the noise that Here's they the create? Yeah. Is, yeah. Will he work with me to legislate and regulate pedicabs once yeah. and for all? Mr Speaker, when I was Mayor of London, I always yearned to be in a position uh, to put this through Parliament, uh, and now I am. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm very grateful to her. We will make sure that we give uh, parliamentary time uh, to make this possible. And I think it will be a boon for cyclists. It will be a boon, Mr Speaker, for taxi drivers. And it's high time we did it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have a humanitarian crisis of food poverty in all the constituencies represented in this House. We've got more food banks than McDonald's, and people now face starving or freezing in their homes at this very moment because of the horrific cost of living crisis, but because of political choices that have been made by this government. In 2015, the government signed up to delivering the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals domestically, including ending hunger. Can the Prime Minister tell me who and what department is responsible for delivering this goal to end hunger domestically? And can he send me a copy of the plan to deliver it? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr Speaker, the whole of government is engaged in that, in that campaign and, and to that end uh, we expanded free school meals uh, for five to seven year olds which helps uh, 1.3 million tr children. We boosted the Healthy Start vouchers uh, by a third, uh, Mr Speaker, and of course there's a holiday uh, food and activities uh, programme uh, that uh, continues to run the £200 million fund. But the best thing that we, uh, we can do as a country, as a society, is keep going uh, with our, our plan for economic growth uh, with higher wage higher skilled jobs, uh, putting bread on, the food, uh, bread on the table of families up and down this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. Speciality Steels is an important steelworks in Stocksbridge in my constituency. It produces high-quality steel and it's provided high-value jobs for generations. But sadly, following the collapse of Greensill Capital, the parent company, Liberty, has faced financial uncertainty for some time, threatening the business and thousands of jobs. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that the steel industry sits at the heart of our levelling yeah, up yeah. agenda? Yeah, yeah. And will he commit to looking at all options to support the business through this period of uncertainty, as the government has done so effectively for Forge Masters and British Steel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Prime Minister. I, I thank her very much, and I thank her for everything she does to, well, to, to, to champion steel. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I think she's right. I think that it is of strategic importance for our country. And we've got to look at ways in which we can help the steel industry uh, to have access to uh, cheaper, low-carbon energy. And this government will, will do everything we can uh, to ensure that that happens. Uh, but we provi- we've, so far, we've provided over £600 million uh, since 2013 to help with the cost uh, of energy. And, uh, and we have uh, we've uh, reduced. We've, we've also put in a £350 million uh, uh, industrial energy transformation fund. But I want to stress to the House that that alone uh, will not be enough as we transition uh, to a low-carbon future. I think that hydrocarbons must also have their place. Barbara yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unpaid family carers are treated appallingly by this government. I'm not talking about paid care staff in care homes, but people who provide care unpaid for family members. While food and energy costs skyrocket, carers' allowance is increasing in April by only £2 to a miserly £69 a week. But this insulting amount will now be more than swallowed up by paying the £2.50 cost of a single lateral flow test so that carers can keep the person they care for safe. How can the Prime Minister justify this tax on caring? I, I thank her very much, and I think that the whole House understands uh, the, the pressures on, on carers and the, the immense amount uh, that they contribute uh, to our society, and uh, we are doing our, our best to support people throughout our, our, our country. Uh, we can't, I think the House also understands that we can't uh, indefinitely support uh, free, uh, free, universal uh, free testing. Uh, what, we are doing, what we are doing is uh, uprating the, the carers' allowance, and of course, uh, carers are also entitled uh, to the increases that we're putting through in universal credit. Andrew Jones. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I follow up my right honourable friend's statement on Monday on removing the COVID restrictions? I welcome the support, the further support for the immunosuppressed. Will he ensure the NHS reviews the system for identifying the most vulnerable, as I think some who are at risk are in danger of being missed? for example, those with blood cancers, and will he then ensure that the relevant testing and antibody, antiviral drugs will be readily available alongside boosters for the immunosuppressed, but also for their carers? Yes, uh, he, he's making a, a very important point about the, uh, about the immunosuppressed and, and, the, and the need to identify them correctly. Uh, we currently think there are 1.3 million. Yes, of course, uh, they will have access not only to testing, but also uh, to vaccines, to, to boosters, and uh, priority access for new uh, therapeutics and antivirals. Shantara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last October, a promising young football in my Ilford South constituency called Kamran Khalid, who was a former winner of Chelsea FC's Asian Star Scheme and played for the famous Senrab FC in Wanstead, was on his way home to see his mum after finishing at the gym and he was stabbed 24 times, murdered just yards from his front door. One of the perpetrators, alleged perpetrators, was as young as 15. So, Mr Speaker, I would hope that the Prime Minister would agree with me that far more needs to be done to stamp out the scourge of knife crime, including addressing the underlying causes. And will he agree to meet me and Cameron's mother, Samina, who has said that losing her 18-year-old son has left a void in her heart forever? To discuss what more can be done to make our streets safer and ensure that other families do not ever have to suffer this heartbreaking loss. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I must say that I, I totally uh, agree with I share his feelings about the, the, his constituents and, and, and the tragedy, and the tragic loss of, of uh, the, the, the family concerned. And we must crack down uh, more on knife crime. It's one of the reasons we're putting more police out on the, uh, on the streets. Uh, and it's also why we're rounding up the county line's drugs gangs. 
and uh, we've done, we've run, and, and I think they play a big part in this. Uh, sadly, we've we've done 2,000 uh, so far. Uh, there is more to do. That's why we're recruiting many more uh, police and giving them the powers they need to come down hard on these gangs. Andy Carter. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Government's commitment of £25 million for a new electric bus fleet in Warrington will have a transformational effect on public transport across Warrington. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that the right way to spend that £25 million is by buying British-made buses, supporting highly skilled jobs, manufacturing jobs, right across the United Kingdom? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, uh, Mr Speaker, I want to th- I'll thank my honourable friend who is a great champion uh, for Warrington. Uh, and, uh, and Warrington has secured £20 million, pounds, Mr Speaker, for new zero emission buses. And I'm, I'm delighted to say in a statistic that I can barely believe, but is in, your, in my brief, that 80% of buses in Britain's urban areas are already produced domestically. Uh, Mr. Speaker, which is which is a fantastic thing, and I hope and I hope and I know that I, we all want to see more of that, and I hope that Warrington will consider excellent UK bus manufacturers when they come to their next contract. Yeah. Hodge. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Prime Minister told me that we can sanction Duma members with the government's new sanctions package. The Right Honourable Member for Braintree told the House that we can sanction Duma members not through the new regime but as an extension of pre-existing sanction rules. Yet this morning, the Foreign Secretary said that the legislation for sanctions against Duma members will take weeks to be made legally watertight. So, Prime Minister, who is right? How can we say we're standing strong against Russian aggression when our sanctions response is such a muddle and such a mess? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I think the whole House will agree, or I hope the whole House will agree, that it's quite a thing uh, to sanction parliamentarians. Uh, and that is what uh, we're doing. Uh, that, is what we're, that is what we're doing. And not only that, uh, we were putting forward just in the last couple of days the biggest package of sanctions against Russia that this country has ever introduced. And we're coming forward with even more. And uh, they will have an impact not just on Duma members, uh, people who vote, people who voted uh, for the secession of the oblasts of Donetsk and uh, Lugansk. They will have an impact on the entire Putin regime. And I'm glad that the Labour opposition, uh, for, at least for now, supports them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is day six for thousands of households across East Sussex who have no power and no water. As we become more and more reliant on electricity, we must become more resilient. Can I ask the Prime Minister to ensure that the utility companies work together, that water companies have to have generators in place so that the water doesn't fail when the power does, and that local resilience forums are fit for purpose and communicate with their local community? We need more help on this, Prime Minister. Please help us. Prime Minister. Uh, I thank him very much for uh, what he said about people in East Sussex, and I just want to say I, I know how, uh, uh, how tough it is for people who have been uh, short of power for, for days on end, and uh, it, it is no consolation to them for me to say that 97 per cent of uh, who lost power have now been reconnected, but we're working as fast as we can with local authorities, uh, with the electricity companies, to make sure that they get their power back, but also ensuring uh, that we build in more resilience for the future. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, let's be quite clear about this. Is it not an absolute disgrace that a Privy Councillor, an adviser to the Queen and a former First Minister of Scotland sees fit to broadcast his half-baked world views week after week on Russian television. Yes. Uh, Mr Speaker, that was a, a brilliant, powerful question with which I think the whole House uh, assented. Would it not have been more powerful if it had come from the leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party? Daniel Kuczynski. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will have seen the devastation in Shrewsbury of the flooding of the River Severn. This is the third year in a row that Shrewsbury has faced these appalling floods. I chair the caucus of 44 Conservative MPs who have the River Severn, Britain's longest river, flowing through their constituencies. 
Will he help me and, and our caucus to do everything possible to find a long-term solution to managing Britain's longest river? And in the meantime, we have put forward four opportunities for flood defences in Shrewsbury to DEFRA. Would he please take an interest in these? Because Shrewsbury cannot afford a fourth year in a row of flooding. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank him very much for, for what he said. And he uh, and he's, he's completely right in what, in, uh, what he says about the Severn and the, the, the violence of flooding uh, in the Severn, which I've seen for myself, the Severn area, which I've seen for myself uh, several times. There are still flood warnings uh, in, uh, in place uh, along uh, the Severn, uh, Mr. Speaker. And all I can tell him is that we are working flat out uh, to, uh, to put the uh, remediations in place to help people who have uh, suffered from flooding, uh, but also investing £5.2 billion uh, in the flood defences of this country. David. The leader in this morning's Times is a scathing criticism of the government's limited sanctions against Russia. If the Prime Minister won't listen to members of this House, would he at least listen to the Times newspaper? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I have the utmost respect for uh, the, the media and, uh, of course, I uh, study, study it as much as I possibly can, but I have to say I think that the package that the UK uh, has put forward uh, has, has, been, uh, has been leading the world uh, and there is, there is more to come. And, uh, Mr Speaker, I hear, I hear uh, somebody uh, on the opposite benches say that this is, uh, this is so far weak. It's not. It's going to be it's strong and it's going to be very strong. Uh, something that would be strong, Mr Speaker, would be to take the whip away from the 14 members of the Labour Party uh, who, 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 who say that the aggressor in Ukraine is NATO. That would be a, that would be a strong thing to do. That's the end of Prime Minister's questions. As you just heard there, that is the end of Prime Minister's questions there from the Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle. Uh, to welcome our guests for this part of the programme for the government, uh, Gillian Keegan, the Care Minister, and Luke Pollard for Labour, the Shadow Armed Forces Minister. Laura Kunzberg, the BBC's political editor, is here. Um, it was an interesting line, a careful line, um, being trodden by uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, in his questions, unsurprisingly, about uh, the reaction to Russian aggression in terms of sanctions, wanting to say, very clearly, we support you here on the Labour benches in the actions that you've taken, but we'd like you to go further and we'd like you to do it now and extremely quickly. And the Prime Minister saying we have uh, taken, undertaken this action in terms of putting pressure on Russia, particularly financially. But before we go further, we want to make sure it's a coordinated action uh, with other financial centres in London, Paris and New York. Does that mean there's going to be some delay then? Well, I think, as you outlined, Joe, Keir Samer was trying to sort of do consensus with a shove, asking for specifics about what and when might be next and what those triggers might be for what the government and other Western governments have said very openly will be the next successive rounds of sanctions as this situation develops. I think, you know, we have been told privately and it's been suggested you know by some ministers publicly that things might look at Russian energy companies or whether they'll look at more financial uh, crackdowns but it, what was interesting was the prime minister said on the record and explicitly there that the government would stop Russian companies clearing mm. dollars and sterling through the city of London now that is not something that was announced yesterday that it was something that would be a major move um, but the government is also just as Keir Starmer was trying to tread a line the government's also trying to tread a line because the belief among Western allies is that an element of coordination is really, really important here. And there isn't a point sort of splintering the West. One of the most important things to do is show a unified approach. But of course, the government here has been under attack by, by, because some of their sanctions are not as strong as other countries. So, for example, if you think about the number of individuals who've been sanctioned, the EU has targeted many more individuals than the UK has just three individuals. And there are various other sort of comparisons. What would you say, Gillian, to Tory MPs, many of them on the Conservative benches, former leaders, heads of select committees, who are saying that the government is acting too slowly. Uh, we'll come to what Labour has said, and we've heard what Keir Starmer said, but to, to your colleagues themselves, who are just saying, what is Boris Johnson waiting for? So you've got to look at the whole context. The first is, it is coordinated. It was coordinated in Munich, and it's looking at each country. So what we need to look at this is through the eyes of Russia, what all of these look like 
through the eyes of Russia and the Russian economy. It is coordinated and there, are, there is an escalating strategy, which is a deliberately escalating strategy. You heard today the next stage of the escalation. But you've also got to put it in context that we have had some restrictions in place for a lot longer than others. So we have 180 individuals, we have 48 companies already... And what impact has that done in terms of deterring Vladimir Putin for taking the action? Well, it hasn't deterred taken. this action, clearly, because no. he's in there. But, you know, that was in response to Salisbury and some of the other things. So we have actually already taken moves because of a well. number of different um, attacks that we've had. But, of course, it's much more sensible to do a coordinated strategy. You know, it, right. looking at finance and banking is clearly where we can make a big difference, but it does have to be coordinate, coordinated with other major financial On that, markets. do you accept that, that if it is all done as one, it will have a much greater impact? It will cause much more pain to Vladimir Putin. If you're looking at the sorts of things that Keir Starmer was suggesting yesterday in response to his statement, to Boris Johnson's statement, uh, trying to exclude Russia from the main financial mechanisms, um, you do it as one, it will have more impact. It certainly would. I think the, the need for strong action is apparent because if we are to deter Russian aggression, further invasions into Ukrainian territory, we need to be absolutely strong and robust. And I think the weak and feeble first wave, I don't think matches the strength that many of our allies have done here. So I do want to see Russia excluded from our financial systems. I do want to see us rid dirty money from our from our politics and from City of London. There are lots of things the government should be doing. They don't have to wait to do it. They could do that today. And that's why the approach that Labour has been taking is to say, we support these measures. We want you to go further. Here are concrete areas where you could go further, where you would enjoy cross-party support. They should get on with that. All right, well, let's have a look at it's one of them. country support we need. It's actually coordinated. It's not a competition. It's deliberately coordinated. And the escalation strategy is also deliberate. So right. Was it agreed that we would start with pretty weak sanctions then? Was, it, was that what, part of the escalation been agreed, strategy? It's all been agreed and next to things is, is also part of the escalation strategy, yes. All right, well, let's and, and then, of course, we've got the longer term, which are already, as we talked about, is the economic right. crime bill as well. So mm. there is a strategy here and it is an escalating, escalating sanction strategy coordinated. And you've already heard some signs of what the next stage is. All right, well, let's have a look at something specific uh, that Keir Starmer suggested yesterday and reiterated today. I'm just going to show everybody this tweet from Stephen uh, Swinford in The Times. Nadine Doris, the Culture Secretary, has told Ofcom, the regulator, to take timely and transparent action against Russian state-backed broadcaster RT. She's concerned RT will look to spread harmful disinformation. I call on you to ensure actions are timely and transparent to reassure the British public. Should they just be banned right now? Um, obviously, politicians should not get involved with that. We have o Ofcom as Why an not? independent... Because you don't want politicians directing what media you allow within a country. Well, even in a state of emergency? Uh, no, you want the... We have robust regulation. Ofcom are doing that. You want them to play their job. It's very important that they're independent. However, there is no doubt, and I believe there's no doubt, that Russia today is part of Russia's disinformation strategy. And Ofcom, I'm, I very much welcome Nadine asking them to review it. I'm sure they were going to anyway with all of this discussion. But they really do need to do that and look specifically at Russia today. Luke? But no, politicians should not ban media. I'm not a fan of Russia today. I'm not a fan of Putin's dis disinformation campaign. It's right that this is reviewed. And I think the language has been carefully chosen there because it needs to be reviewed, so it's not open to legal challenge mm. from Russia today. But Russia today is one of Putin's... Uh, elements of spreading misinformation that is so frequently shared in social media feeds that is designed to split the West, designed to split the consensus that we are trying to build in this country against his, uh, against his aggression. That's why strong measures are required and I hope this review won't take weeks and months. It should be completed in days. Would you understand members of the public taking a rather dim view when politicians have appeared in the past, yeah. I admit in the past, on Russia today, both Conservative and Labour politicians? Yeah, it mm. adds credibility and having a former politician Politician presenting a show, as, as was discussed Alex today, Salmond, yeah. is, is adding, you know, it adds credibility. And for the, from the public's viewpoint, they won't be able to distinguish that. The problem, though, why previously this has not happened, mm. despite for many years, actually, politicians in this country being concerned about the activities of Russia today, but particularly acutely right now, is that, as ever, there is the question of being beware of unintended consequences. So were the UK's regulators to take action against Russian broadcasters in the UK, there, of course, could potentially be consequences for British journalists trying to do 
you know, the right thing and provide journalism to people in other countries and notably in Russia. And of course, I mean, we would say this, wouldn't we? But the BBC and other United Kingdom media outlets also, you know, are in Russia trying to provide free, fair and impartial coverage. So it's easy for politicians to call for it but unintended consequences could follow. And at this point, we'll just say goodbye to viewers from BBC News Channel. Um, Laura, you spoke to Keir Starmer, um, mm. I mean, it was just a few weeks ago, yes, I think, about 10 um, ago. on the day that he was in Brussels himself. It was when uh, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary were there uh, meeting uh, NATO officials, and he restated Labour's commitment to the alliance, that it was unshakable, sort of trying to draw a line um, between him and his predecessor. Oh, yes, I don't think he was sort of trying to draw a line. I think he was trying to do a 20-foot banner saying, mm. I'm different to the former bloke. I mean, no question about it. Um, he would try repeatedly all of the optics of his visit to go to NATO to hold a meeting with Jens Stoltenberg, the leader of the Western allies there. I think it was both carefully calculated and calibrated by his team at this moment to show a very distinct difference and to try to look back in history to say, well, actually, forget about what happened under Jeremy Corbyn. Actually, Labour's always <coughs> been the party of NATO and was involved in its founding. Right. The difficulty for him is there's still members in the party, still mm. a sprinkling of sitting Labour MPs who are very uncomfortable about it. And for him also, there is the question, and we pressed him on this last week, about if he'd felt that strongly all along, how did he resolve sitting alongside Jeremy Corbyn during those years he was in charge? Right. What message would you send to Boris Johnson? I think he said 14... Uh, members of the Labour Party, Labour MPs, who should have the whip taken away uh, by the party because they see NATO as the aggressor. Well, NATO's not the aggressor here. We've got a defensive yeah, but I'm alliance. I'm asking what you, sh you should say to your colleagues on the well, Labour benches. I don't share that view. Neither does Keir. That's not the view that's prevailing in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. We have an unshakable commitment to NATO and to uh, supporting our allies. Uh, it must be remembered that there is Russian aggression here. It is not NATO that is the aggressor in this situation. Mm -hmm. NATO presence is defending our allies on uh, the eastern flank, Poland, uh, uh, Lithuania, Estonia and others. They are NATO members. We have an obligation to defend them but we also have an obligation to call out in, uh, uh, a wrongdoing, aggression that Putin is doing. There's 200,000 right. Russian troops massing yeah. on Ukraine. It's not NATO troops there. So how big a problem is this for the Labour Party when young Labour, the youth wing of the Labour Party, says NATO's acts of aggression, both historical and present, are a threat to all of our safety? Young Labour's delegates from across our membership and affiliates voted that we should withdraw from NATO and pursue an international policy based on peace, adopting this as official policy. Labour is a broad church, isn't it? Is this difficult? We are a broad church, but we don't make policy based on Young Labour's tweets. Uh, our commitment to NATO is strong and firm and unshakable. We're not changing that. And at this very moment, when we've got an aggressor threatening the sovereignty and territorial integrity of an ally of a democratic country, we need to be joining ourselves up to make clear that it is President Putin who is the aggressor here, and we need to support our allies. Right. Would you like to distance yourself further from the youth wing of the Labour Party? Oh, I, 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 my grey hair distances me from the youth of the Labour Party. <laughs> That's to be a very honest. clever response. <laughs> it's which I mean in a form. It is important that you're really clear on this because you know we saw it with the last Labour leadership on Salisbury. I mean, he didn't even side with us. He did not even side with his own country. You've got to be crystal clear when you face these these insurgencies or these attacks on your own soil. Which side are you on? You've got to be crystal clear. And you were not crystal clear in your last you know, government that you had, shadow government that you had. You've still got elements of this, and it is really yeah. important well, because this but is let's what be clear. the country... At the moment, we need the to country be showing... People in rely on their government at these We moments need to be to showing be our parties clear. together on this. And this, this is what Keir was saying in PMQs. You know, the Prime Minister couldn't help himself to throw in partisan points, but what we were deliberately showing in the way that Keir asked his questions was that we need to show a united front, mm. because in and this division... very much appreciated. When, when those type of comments, Julian, that you just made get chucked in, But these are important. The They're division. still here. That's the point of this questioning. There's still an element of this and you can't have any no. any those individuals doubt. are not in charge of the Labour Party Keir's now, in charge of the, the Labour young, Party they're the next generation Keir's in charge of the Labour Party he has set out clearly that we and stand with our allies and we stand with NATO all right well in terms of whose side are you on when it comes to these allegations and claims of too much money coming from 
uh, be it political donations, uh, the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister are very clear to say they are all legal and above board and they've all been declared. But money that is washing around the city um, and the square mile, has there been too much going on uh, over the past decade under Conservative governments? Well, there's been a lot of things that we have done, right? We've set up an economic crime centre, we've obviously had an economic crime plan, we've had the, the Act in 2017 and then we've got the Economic Crime Bill, well, which on, is on, complicated. What's the, yeah, what's the Act in 2017? The 2017 is the Economic um, yeah. Criminal Finances Act. But actually, when did Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, actually bring an end to this golden visa scheme, which the government itself has admitted has allowed many Russian oligarchs to continue? It was a scheme started under Labour uh, in 2008 to encourage wealthy mm -hmm. people from outside the EU to invest in the UK. Um, but there have been people, I think a couple of hundred people, being able to buy their way into the UK. Why wasn't that stopped earlier? Well, I mean, obviously all these things take time, you've got to make a decision, you, you weigh these things week. up. You know, the, there's something similar to what Laura said before in terms of ramifications, right? You know, if you do something, for example, Russia Today, what do you expect? You then justify a reaction which says, well, you've got rid of all these BBC journalists because they shouldn't be doing this. So you don't want this tit-for-tat, tit-for-tat choosing who... You've got, to, you've got to have some good evidence and some good reasons why you say, those people with money, no, those Minister, not. And we've got to be really, really careful, by the way, not to... Uh, incriminate Russian people. Russian Absolutely. people, but and Minister, most of the Russian people here have actually fled from this but regime. Minister, are you suggesting that there is not evidence that shows that successive governments in this country have allowed Russian money to swill around the city? No, of I'm London. not, and I'm saying more because transparency that evidence has been there for a long and, time. And more transparency needs to be brought forward. I think the Economics Crime Bill is going to be very important. It is complex legislation. You've got the tech element now with cyber security and you know these partial tokens, etc. So it is more complex, which is why it can't just be done in a few days or a few weeks. So it is complex to get these things right. It's important that the legislation is got right. But we do take it seriously right. and we've, we've indicated that is what's coming next and we are absolutely going to bring that economic crimes bill forward. Let's talk to you about your brief um, because we had the head of the NHS Confederation on just before Prime Minister's questions. Uh, he wants to know, um, Matthew Taylor, about whether the government is going to provide free COVID tests to NHS frontline staff and continue to do so beyond April the 1st. So what we've said is we are now looking at what is the regime that we need to put in place right. in care homes, in the NHS. Um, so we're working with the scientists now. They want a bit more time, so we've said we will publish that by April the 1st. So that is being worked up, that plan right now. That doesn't now. give them much time to plan, does it? So it does mean, as Matthew Taylor was saying very clearly, you could have asymptomatic NHS staff coming into hospitals. They don't want to pay, let's say, £5 per test. They don't feel sick, so they don't feel they have to, and yet they could be spreading infections. Well, this is what the JCVI, UXA, they're all looking well, at now. What's your view, uh, Gillian, as the Care Minister? Do you think that should continue to be free testing for those sectors, NHS frontline staff, visitors? I'm not going to set homes. the policy when you've got a load of scientists working up what makes sense. I think the most important thing in living with COVID is if you look at the hospitalisations, if you look at the severity of the disease, if you look at the vaccination rates, if you look at actually now, most people are... A, a, I mean, I, I had COVID last week. I didn't have a single symptom yeah. so you know there is there is now elements which is what it is we need to do to live with covid the therapeutics the vaccines and the surveillance right. are the most important pillars testing has been a brilliant yeah. fantastic in pillar we have had two billion sure. tests in this country right. right everybody's had loads of them but they and they've been absolutely fantastic but they're not the best pillar for living with covid they're not the most um mm. uh, they're not the be the best way to uh, even to spot what's going on all right, right? there's Luke? a random Nature. No, no, I mean, we do need to continue with the testing regime because it is a nonsense. The, what, the, for everybody? To, to enable free tests, especially for those in the most vulnerable settings, okay, yep. because I think those people with underlying vulnerabilities sure. have been neglected. Well, that's They've what they're looking at. No, they have not here. been. They have not been neglected they at all. Been neglected, They've been the number the one minister, focus. And what, what the announcement should have been last week was, and we won't, won't withdraw the uh, free testing from these groups until we've received the scientific you, evidence. You, but that wasn't the announcement. The announcement look, was look withdrawing at, free testing. That's what people that heard. That was a general. No, that was so a general. So that's what people heard. That was what the announcement. 
announcement was. No. So we do need to continue that's, this. It can't don't, be forever. Don't, don't, don't repeat I, that, because I don't want people to think that that's the case. We have said for any... But you do agree that that was... But that's the broad trust of what we said, Gillian. But for adult social... OK, so I'm the minister responsible, so I know for adult social care that all that we're waiting for all these people to look at the tests, to look at look at what they advise based on the work that they're doing. I know that programme of work's going on, so maybe I have an advantage there. But, but that was always the case, minister, and we are waiting for... Minister. And by the way, they have diff we've been different throughout the general population and care homes quite this often. Quite but, right. minister, but, message, though, but Minister, it? in terms of maintaining the testing regime, weren't there actually very good reasons why your boss at the Department of Health was asking the Treasury for £6 billion to keep the testing regime as it was. And the fact that he lost that battle means that it will be harder for ordinary people to try and do the right thing. You know, tests are going to cost, what, £12 for a pack of five, a pack of six? For many, many, many working people, you might feel a bit unwell, mm. but money's tight, inflation's going through the roof. You think, I can't afford to stay off work, I might not be able to afford to go and get a test. I mean that's the the creating a two-tier system, isn't it? The Treasury, the Treasury and the Health Service no. have a lot of discussions, as you mm -hmm. know, and which is why we've had tens and tens of billions more yeah. in funding from the Treasury all the way through this pandemic. And you know, on the specifics of this, this, your department lost out, and that means that the testing regime there's, is being there's scaled There's always back. a negotiation. There's always a discussion. Where we've landed, I think, is a is a good place in terms of what we need to do. But they're working through. You know, what does the surveillance look like? a good place like? if what? you've got a vulnerability. If you're a care home, uh, if, if you're, is it someone well, you're with a vulnerability? You're assuming about something it. that we. We haven't yet announced the policy. Oh, but can you understand people's anxiety? That I at the can, very least? but we have to let them look, work through this and tell us, you know, what. Oh. It won't be the same as it is now, right? So we'll be looking at what Fine. makes sense in these settings and what is going to be effective. But, you've, but the on message top has of been eroded. And yeah. and everything the confidence else. has been eroded in this. Confidence comes and from the vaccine. Please be clear about this. Confidence. So I want to people to have the vaccine. Yes, it's a different thing. An can, I just, part of this. can I just ask Gillian one last important. question uh, before the end of the programme, which is about the sick pay arrangements, because this also feeds into what is going to be provided by the government. Does there need to be a more generous sick pay, statutory sick pay, when we go to a relative state of normality post COVID? Well, I mean, statutory sick pay, from what I understand, is about ninety-six pounds, something like this, per week. It's about a quarter um, of what people get in Germany. And but that's mm -hmm. On top of other benefits as well, other means tested benefits, including universal credit, etc. So you can't just take one piece of it because obviously we All have right. quite a complex system. We need to which fix moves, it, right? It's clearly broken. It needs to be fixed. If the government's going to be withdrawing large amounts of this, we need to live well with COVID. All we right. need to not ignore it. You've taken us to the end of the programme. Thank you to all of my guests. I'll be back tomorrow at 12.15. Bye bye.